Island Day today. I got yeah. my guy, George Sedano, <laughs> what up, what up? Miami native, and I got Coach David Fisdale, former assistant coach up, with brother? the Miami Heat. And all around NBA like beloved individual. That's what <laughs> everyone loves. Is there anyone who doesn't love Pierce? He's the most beloved oh, person in NBA right now. Players no that doesn't even play for you love you. How does that even happen? I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know. Good all time. right. Wait, man. Let's let's do this. Let's get to the biggest <laughs> game of the weekend. I'm sure you got a couple of friends here. The Thunder picked up a huge road win against the Rockets in the ABC Saturday prime time game. As a result, OKC can clinch a playoff spot with a win at Miami tonight or with losses by both Denver and Minnesota. Coach Fizz, did that win Saturday prove to you that the Thunder can be anybody? Well, I always thought they could. Uh, the, the problem with them right now is they can lose to anybody. Right. I think that's always been the question. So um, I just I wasn't surprised by last night. I know Eric Gordon and uh, Anderson were out, but that's the playoff sometimes. You may be without players. I think it was a big win for them and, and just moving forward. And it's a good confidence builder for him. In a given, on a given night, I mean, sure. I don't think there's any question because you have that kind of talent. You have the former MVP and Russell Westbrook. But in a series, I haven't seen enough consistency from these no. guys to sit here and say, as stacked as the West is right now, oh, yeah, they're, they're locked into at least the second round. And that's what we thought their ceiling was going into the season. Right. That's not a given at this point. You know, it's, it's funny because I thought, and I don't, this is probably not going to be a popular opinion. That's probably the best game Russell Westbrook played defensively all year long. Yeah, for sure. Or in a, in a couple oh, of years, yeah, maybe. I mean, like, <laughs> he was locked in. He was paying attention to coverages, locking and trailing, peeling off when he had to peel off. He did all the right things. Yeah. And to me, it's like that, that was the thing that made me think, if the stakes are high, he can lock in and do all the right things. Mm -hmm. So what's more higher than a playoff series? Maybe that's a good sign that, yeah, they're, they're like a lot of talented individuals, a lot of talented teams, they get bored with the humdrum of the regular season. You get to a playoff series particularly, they're going to be underdogs starting on yeah. the road. Maybe this is what they need. But listen, I'm a huge Paul George fan, but if you see the numbers, what is he shooting, 30%? Yeah, not good. Basically since the All-Star break? Yeah. I mean, that's more than just a slump at this point. And Melo seems invisible at times in this particular offense with this particular team. Early in the season, they were getting him his touches, but he just doesn't look like the same dude right now. You know what, though, still, when you have that kind of talent, Paul George can snap out of that. Right. I mean, that's as good as, good as he's been and, and the, the, as many playoff series as we've seen him play in at a high level. When the lights are on, the popcorn's popping, a guy like Paul George is going to show up. We already know Russell Westbrook can take it to a level that no one else can take it to many nights. And I just think Carmelo is one of those seasoned veterans that in the playoffs, when the game slows down and you need a guy that can go get you a bucket, Carmelo Anthony is going to be that guy for him. You know what this shows, I mean, that at least for the regular season, it's hard to play with Russ, man. Like Victor Oladipo last year, he didn't have the kind of numbers he's having in Indiana. Now, granted, he's getting more touches, more opportunities, but maybe he should have gotten more touches and more opportunities in Oklahoma City, and maybe that's what we're seeing with Paul and with Melo a little bit. Russell's great, but, man, it's tough. I'll battle you on the Oladipo <laughs> thing a little bit. Oladipo learned some stuff from Russell Westbrook, and you can I guarantee you if you ask him that, he'd tell you that. He changed his body. He went into the summer with a chip on his shoulder. He got traded to Indiana, and he got unleashed. I think he had to go through what he went through in OKC to, to become, become yeah. Oladipo. But Russell is a, is a dominant personality. He's a dominant player in this league. You know, guys have to figure out their way around him. Um, you know, it's the same as playing with any other great player. Well, Coach, I want to ask you a quick question going back to what we were talking about, Paul George. When you, you know, again, I, I called you one of the most beloved figures in the NBA. You're a guy on the staff that's close to a lot of players. You've got a player who's going to shooting something like, Paul is as extended as it. What do you do? You talk to him about it? Do you ignore yeah, it? What do you do? Don't don't dodge it. I mean, it's it's the elephant in the room. Just deal with it. All right. Get into your film. Film him in practice from different angles. Show him the difference between when he was making shots, when he wasn't making shots. Uh, simplify things for him. Get in the gym at night. Turn on the music. Let him just feel good about being in the gym and sweating again. There's a lot of different ways you can attack it. But with that kind of talent, he'll get back to it. All right. <laughs> there you have it. That sounds like a recipe. At least on defense, you know, you can rely well, on him yeah, there, right? Good. No matter what happens. And he's going to get layups, free throws, dunks, stuff like that, transition. That'll open up things for him. My, my thing about them is, real quick before we move on to the Rockets, is I think if they lock in defensively, they'll, they'll, get, they'll take care of it. Yep. Let's check in on the Rockets, though, who suffered their first home loss since January. Harden was teed up in the fourth quarter. CP got a tee in the second quarter. George... I can't believe we're asking this question. Are you worried about the Rockets losing their composure? 
Man, a little bit. I gotta Come be on, honest, man. man. I am a little bit. Hey, went a whole year we didn't bring this no, topic no, up. No, now I know, I know. But but <laughs> the underlying thing always was, well, you know, their postseason history. Right. Whether it's Mike D'Antoni, whether it's Chris Paul, or whether it's James Harden, it hasn't always been pretty. Now, I think Chris Paul um, takes a lot of grief, and it, it shouldn't be the case, because if you look at his numbers during these postseason runs, they've been phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, but we saw James Harden get gassed last year. We've seen Mike D'Antoni have some struggles in the postseason. So I don't think it's unfair to question them. And when you go back to Chris Paul, as great as he's been in some of these postseasons, he's been attached, I mean, to some of these teams bad, that have lost losses. their composure and had some bad losses in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're going to have to definitely, when the moment comes, they're going to have to uh, gain their composure and keep their composure. Uh, but I just think this is so unfamiliar to them. They haven't lost at home in so long. It was yeah. like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> It's just a weird land for them, uh, you know, because they've been kicking butt for so long. But I think these guys are ready to go. I think that's showing that they still have their edge. They're not just taking a loss. Um, you know, they were pissed off about it, and that's a good thing. So you want them going into the playoffs a little with a little fur up on their back. Yeah, I don't mind that. I do, because all of a sudden you're in cruise control and you yeah. just think you can't be beat, and then right. you get popped all of a sudden in the playoffs, and it could change quick. And, that, and that's what makes this year's playoffs so interesting. We'll get into that later, but the idea that usually you're a one seed, you're like, I probably already got my scouts ready. It's probably not a very good team that limped right. its way in. And this year, you, you might be right. playing a team that can go to the conference finals uh, in terms of talent all throughout the, the conference. So we'll see how that goes. All right, guys, it's been some fun so far. But time to jump in the helicopter. Uh-oh. It's over. <laughs> the Heat Island, baby. That's right. Pat Riley, LeBron James, not been on the best of terms since LeBron left the Heat to go back home in 2014. But according to some quotes obtained from author Ian Thompson's upcoming book, Riley has come to understand why LeBron left. Riley said, quote, I had two to three days of tremendous anger. Yeah, right, more than three days. I was absolutely livid, which I expressed to myself and my closest friends. My beautiful plan all of a sudden came crashing down. That team in 10 years could have won five or six championships, but I get it. I get the whole chronicle of LeBron's life. So, Fizz, you know, I got the, I had to go full heat out. <laughs> you were an assistant with the Heat back when this all went down. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your reaction to hearing these quotes from Pat? I mean, it was an emotional situation, an emotional time. We we're all emotional. So, you know, I don't think Coach ever overly expressed it publicly um, or, or, or tried to demean LeBron in any way uh, or make him look terrible in any way. But we all felt something. You know, we had went through a lot together. You know, you go through losing two finals. You know, you start come, becoming family, you know, and, and getting really close. And so when he made that decision initially, yeah, it stung, you know. But I think we all took a step back and understood once he did it why he did it. And, you know, I think water is under the bridge now and everybody's moved on from that stuff. I mean, in December of 2016, I got a chance to have an extended conversation with Pat Riley for a piece I was doing when they were retiring Shaq's right. jersey. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so when I spoke to him then, I got the sense after talking to him about Shaq, because we talked a little bit about some of the teams that came after, um, that Pat is at a stage of his life where he realizes, you know what, um, it's about your legacy. And that means it's also about mending fences. That Shaq thing was about mending fences. Uh, the Dwayne situation recently, and now you have this LeBron situation. But don't get it twisted. You said Matt Pat's mellowed out? No, but don't get it twisted, though. Pat is still laser focused, laser focused on trying to win. But I think that part of him realizes that relationships matter for your legacy. And his, you know, he, he goes 100 miles an hour, as you know, Fizz. Yeah. And sometimes he'll rub people the wrong way. But at the end of the day, he wants it to be family. Yeah, he always wanted it to be about winning and family. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Coach knows as well as anybody, we're his storytellers. We're his right. legacy. We are the people that's going to keep... Uh, his legend alive, you know, those stories that that we will tell and people that play for him will tell. And, you know, he loved these guys. He loved LeBron. He loved D-Wade, Chris Bosh and these guys. So, you know, it was it was just a different kind of atmosphere. And that's why you, you may have seen some emotional stuff come out of this. We, we just saw some clips of the, the parade, the not one, not two, that parade. In one of the quotes <laughs> that's in the book is that Pat said he didn't know that was going down like that. They were busy doing... Uh, working on the sign and trades to get right. LeBron and Chris Bosh in there. Did you guys know that there was this huge thing being? No, nah, it kind of it kind of happened spur of the moment. You know, all of that stuff happened so fast, and and quite honestly, looking back at it, it was it's a blur. Um, <laughs> you know, when those guys all came in and their families and just it was so many people 
um, just everywhere. Just People were just in the streets when they heard about it. Think about that. Like, right. a, a free agent gets signed and people just flooded the streets. <laughs> well, well, I remember it. There were 18,000 people in the arena, <laughs> yeah, okay? A, and, know. by the way, thousands outside it watching was, on the was, Jumbotron on Biscayne Boulevard. Like, it, it was, was something insane. historic, man. Uh, and I don't know how to even say how we, if we responded right, wrong, or indifferent. I just know it was chaos. But the interesting part to me was the anecdote that Jackie, Mc, I think that Jackie McMullen or Dave McMiniman added to the piece that's on ESPN.com mm -hmm. about LeBron through a source close to LeBron wanting to potentially mend those fences with Pat and speaking to him right. and that his that source believed that that wasn't uh, in the cards because Pat's old school yeah. and you're either with him or against him but clearly to me this is an olive branch by Pat Riley yeah. saying you know what LeBron you are a free agent maybe we should talk it was, it was Jackie Mack that added that point um, the other uh, the, I mean the, the book I'm sure is gonna be tremendous yeah. because you talk about the scene of when LeBron first arrived the first plane ride when he came off the plane and Pat said he looked like he was, he was hurt. Yeah. He was hurt because what happened with the, the, uh, the statement from Cavs uh, majority owner Dan Gilbert, uh, it, it's really kind of descriptive stuff that we've never really heard about. They were stunned by it. Yeah. yeah the reaction. Yeah. But just, just him, how he was carrying himself right. coming off of that plane right. in Miami, kind of dazed, I would say. Um, Think about it. Yeah. Your whole life is played out on this stage in front of everybody in Ohio. Yeah. All right. And then all of a sudden you make this, I mean, which is a tough decision to make. You make that decision to go to Miami. That's not easy to leave your friends, your family. You know, you're hurting the economy, yeah. your right. state, I mean, and your city. How many people can say that? He carries that weight and it's, it, it was a serious weight on him. Fizz, one, one last thing I want to ask you. From the outside looking in, it looked at 2014, you guys, the team was older, injuries are starting to be more an issue. I know we, on the inside, you guys have an optimism of your process and what you guys do. But given what Golden State has been able to do, how would that have matchup have looked like? If, my, if been, you guys had kept that thing together and going up against Golden State? It would have been seven-game series. I deeply believe that. I think if, because uh, we would have had to, like, you know, obviously replace a few things, right. move a few pieces around because that team was getting older. But I tell you what, just talking about the, the six nines, yeah. <laughs> all of those six switch nines everything. on the court, switch everything. Uh, ultimate competitors, incredible coaching. Uh, it would have been one of those. It would have been like us and the Spurs the first time. Oh. Just seven games of just clashing and, and chess matches and big time talent and, and spectacular plays. All right. Man, I wish we could have seen I that. I wish, too. Yeah. All right. So does Fizz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a couple more playoff bonuses. <laughs> Coming up, I'll give a shout-out to some unsung heroes for teams preparing for the playoffs. But first, here's a distant replay from this date in 2002. Is it Vince Carter? Let's see. Hudson runs see. it down. It's not Vince Carter. Oh! He's coming. Who's the man at that? Is he sipping the tea after that? Oh, man. Who passes the ball? Is that Clay Hudson? Yeah, yeah. Clay yeah. Hudson. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Who caught the body? Oh, the trail? No. No, that was Clarence Weatherspoon, oh, right? Yeah. Or Othello Harrington. Othello Harrington. Othello Harrington. Mm. Shout out Othello Harrington. My yeah. man. George.